in um, Sarawak and in Malaysia, our challenge is um, the lack of oncologists. There is only currently eight oncologists in the whole of Sarawak serving a population of 2.6 million. And we are all in Kuching. <laughs> Meaning outside of Kuching, there is no oncologist. I had done the heart, I had done the set up the research, and the next thing I want to be passionate about it. It's the last part of my, the ending part towards my medical life and my profession is to set up cancer. I remember that he will always organise once a week a dedicated time for MO teaching. He will usually sit us down and say, is there anything that you want to ask? Is there anything that you want to learn? He always made himself available. So I think, to me, he's a very genuine mentor, yeah. I always believe that if I go in, if I can set the work on the policy, it will benefit a lot more people. Five years ago, we need time flies. Yeah, it's incredible. What was your expectation, Winnie, when uh, I was standing for election five years ago at the time when this documentary was made? Mm. Well, honestly, no expectations <laughs> because I'm a very non-political person. But I've worked with you before, Prof, um, and I've worked with you and known you long enough and well enough to know that. Whatever it is, you will get the job done, you will do a good job. Because first of all, you love Sarawak, and then you are a very sincere person and you are a people person. And third, I think you really walk the talk. Someone who's a good planner and who's a doer. I think you are a real workaholic. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you think you have accomplished what you set out to achieve back in 2016? Well, I mean, we want to do a lot more, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 can't. Yeah? But we have uh, tried our very best. Most of the things that we had done, five years ago, when I was in Batkawa, a lot of people just a bit skeptical. They said, we give Dr. Singh a chance. Yeah? We give them a chance. And I am very grateful for that opportunity to prove that. Uh, in fact, you know, nowadays you talk about Batkawa, right? I am very sure a lot of people said, wow. You know? But I, we're not going to stop there. We are going to move forward to, uh, to the next level. Oh, we need and never ask you, why? How did you get into medicine? <laughs> um, I think very long story, but I think the short answer is it's just because of uh, dreams and ideals. I've always wanted to become a doctor since I was a kid, but I think um, because of the support, love and faith, especially for my family, my mom especially, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm doing what I love today and back in our home state, so that's a real, real bonus. Uh, how many years stay overseas? Long time overseas. I was in Singapore, then Australia. I did my housemanship in Australia before coming back. So we so, were away a long time. So you will be very similar to me. I mean, uh, I have more than uh, I spent 17 years in Melbourne, and then when I come back, it's a cultural shock for me because uh, all my friends are in Australia. I only have the family relatives, all the uncle and aunties, and you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very different. But like like you said, I mean, uh, you're doing your job that you love. Eh? And it's something which I feel very proud that I can do similarly, enjoy what I'm doing for Sarawak. Oh, Prof, <laughs> we both know that there's many talented Sarawakian in every field, but there is a certain extent, a certain brain drain in our society and many of our bright talents moving abroad, maybe initially because of our education, but subsequently decided to stay behind. Many people about, worry about coming back and whether they can get uh, a good job here. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think this is very interesting because you and me are two classical examples of how we move back from overseas. So I told those Sarawakians that who are overseas, and there are a lot of opportunities, especially in the next five years. Uh, Sarawak uh, government has formulated what we call post-COVID-19 development plan. And the post-COVID-19 development plan is a, is a framework and uh, outlining where are the different sectors that we want to develop. And the, the best and the golden era of Sarawak is yet to come. And mainly because Sarawak at the moment, we are fourth largest GDP. And uh, that is at 127 billion a year last year. And that's when the oil and gas prices are very low. So on the next 10 years, we are going to increase our GDP from 127 billion to 200 uh, about 270 billion. 
indirectly, when you increase that, you create a lot of jobs, and there will be at least two hundred thousand uh, high level, uh, high income generating jobs. So in the next few years, Sawa government has already outlined where we are going in terms of digital economics, in terms of infrastructures, in terms of medicines. We want to continue to raise our standards and specialties. We also want all those geek economics, those fun. Um, the parents, my parents, or all still that that's a funny economy, but that's the future, you know. We need. I mean, the COVID nineteen pandemic has caused a lot of disruption and hardship for everyone. And how does this pandemic pandemic affected your life professionally and maybe personally with your small children around? Mm. Well, I think. <laughs> It's an understatement to say that uh, COVID, the pandemic has really turned our whole world upside down. I think um, the pandemic also made us grateful that we live in a community that truly looks out for one another. I think when the, the crisis first hit, um, the hospitals, like every other hospital in the world, they are short of PPEs, short of necessary equipment. And I, we, we see a lot of good folks around us, just ordinary people and NGOs in the community. They just rise up, you know, um, source for donations, buy material, uh, organize sewing of their P the PPEs and deliver it to the hospital. And earlier this year, when there's MCO, there are food banks all over Kuching, and uh, veteran doctors and nurses who volunteered after office hour um, to get as many people vaccinated for as fast as possible once the vaccines are available. Um, I think that is the spirit of let's just do it. Um, and that we know that, you know, this crisis will come and pass and together we will emerge stronger. And so that's what keeps us going. Oh, Prof, as a medical doctor, what do you think? Has your background as a doctor helped you in leading Sarawak and combating uh, COVID-19? Yeah, I, I, must, uh, I must say we, uh, the COVID-19, right, even caught all of us by surprise, total surprise. Because initially there's a lot of fears and, and all those things. And then uh, not only fears of unknown, fears of uh, fake news also, uh, fears of knowing that we don't have enough, like you said, PPE and so on. I always tell everyone, but I am very, very proud of Salam King. Like all the volunteers, medical doctors, be it just graduated or be it the very senior one who are in semi retirement, everyone come out to do something. This is indeed extraordinary. And I always say that how good a country is performing is during the crisis time. And the, the donations that pouring in is, I will never expect. But the results speak for itself. I mean, that we are, when the vaccine comes, we are the first one in the country to finish doors one and doors two. And because again, all our medical professions, all our nursing profession, everyone come out and work together, together with our people who are who said, yes, I will go and do it instead, instead of saying, oh, no, no, I want to stay at home, anti vax and so on. And then we can see that the result of vaccination saved many lives compared to elsewhere. This is a tremendous spirit of Sarawak, you know, in, in our solidarity. And we need to maintain that point of Sarawak moving forwards. There's a part two, Pa. Uh. It says, tell us about a typical day in your last five years. 7 to 11, but I think yours is 7 a.m. till 2, 2 a.m. Uh, huh? I mean, it's more like 7 to 1. I tell people 7 to 1, and, and I tell them 1, right? It's not 1 p.m., not, not the 7 a.m. until 1 p.m. shift. You know? It's 7, 1 7 a.m. until 1, 1 a.m. You know? But this is a typical, I mean, uh, but this is not surprising if we look at our medical job. Yeah? And a lot of people keep asking me, uh, where do you get the energy? Where do you get, uh, how can you can do that? I said, this is all the doctors are. Uh, working like that. And now it just it happens that I do in politics. Uh, so far, touch wood, God has given me a, very, a good health, you know, a good health for me to continue this. And that's why uh, for me, I always say that I want every 10 years, I mean, I think it's enough for us to contribute however I want to contribute. And then we groom the young people so that you know, they got a chance to get promoted. This, we need to describe for us what is your patients and their family go through in fighting the disease, especially uh, the cancer. And, 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 and I, I know you very well that you the your palliative care. You know that is uh, that is your very passionate about it. Your sister very passionate about it. Can you describe to us what is all this about? 
medical science as well as cancer care has changed tremendously, has grown leaps and bounds in the last few decades and especially in the last 10 years. Um, cancer is no longer a death sentence, but it still strikes fear in most of our hearts, right? But actually, early stages cancer are very curable, but the bottom line is you need to get access to that care, right? In um, Sarawak and in Malaysia, our challenge is um, the lack of oncologists. There is only currently eight oncologists in the whole of Sarawak, serving a population of 2.6 million. There's five of them in Sarawak General Hospital and three of us in the private side. And we are all in Kuching. <laughs> Meaning outside of Kuching, there is no oncologist and there's no access to um, good quality or easy accessibility to good oncology care. So that, that is an ongoing challenge. We are blessed in a sense to, in Sarawak and Malaysia to have almost free cancer care in a government hospital. Um, but access is an ongoing issue. There's also transportation costs. If you are from Miri, you have to fly to uh, Kuching. Again, um, our Sarawak, our first palliative care physician in 2021, we finally has our first palliative care <laughs> physician in Kuching. So we really, um, Dr. Sharon Chu, she's now at Sarawak General Hospital. So we really need to rally uh, around her to help train, develop palliative care, which is a very much um, needed service in Sarawak um, so that we can really reach uh, provide palliative care for everyone who needs it in Sarawak. Yeah. Okay, Winnie, just like you touch on access, you know what I mean? Like you see, I mean, car because the cardiac centre, it made, it made at least a people access, even though we are the only one, but uh, but I mean the cancer access, you know, what, what do you think, what are the challenges and how can we do it better? I think it's both difficult for the people that are providing the care as well as for the patients and their family. Um, the oncologists at Sarawak General Hospital are doing their best, right? But there's only five of them. So they are probably doing two to three times their workload. So I'm a private oncologist. So sometimes I refer my patients um, to Sarawak General Hospital as well for patients who cannot afford treatment in the private. And I must say my colleagues in the Gamma Hospital is always very um, helpful. They will always accept my referrals. But I always prep my patients and said, that's a limited number of them, they are doing their best, so they will be waiting time. Yeah. Apart from manpower, yeah? So manpower is, is, is a big issue. Uh, manpower, equipment. Um, the other thing is logistic, I think. Easy accessibility to oncology care, I think is a big, big thing for our patients. And if we really are serious about providing that good care, we must make it more accessible. Uh, more people doing it. So maybe, I don't know, you, you have experience um, <laughs> Building out a cardiac service, maybe you can do that for oncology as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I had done the heart, I had done the set up the research, and the next thing I want to be passionate about it is the last part of my, the ending part towards my medical life and um, profession is to set up cancer. And I have started the journey in 20, 2018 because I realized that as a medical doctor working in hospital, you can do so much. Anything above that, right? It's a policy matters, and that a policy matters, and then you have to have political will. So in 2018, I started asking the Prime Minister at that point in time, Dr. Sri Nazi, and he said, okay, uh, I will give you 400 million. Then you change your government. Change your government. So then I had to uh, speak to the Health Minister because I, I don't have access to Dr. Mahadev, uh, which is from di different alliance. And then I speak to the Health Minister. Health Minister said, oh, uh, yes, I realize how important it is, but it is something which we will look into it. And when I said look into it, it's always in trouble. And then, uh, then change the government. So the third prime minister in three years, uh, Tan Sri Muhyiddin, and I had the opportunity to see him personally again. He said, oh, too expensive, and federal government has not enough funding. So then I quickly come back to see our chief minister, Aban Jo, and said, uh, the federal government said not enough money. Can we look at how Sarawak government is going to finance first? Because after the financing the school, you know, the dilapidated school. So um, our CN said, yes, definitely. Since it's, uh, if the longer we wait, the more Sarawakian will die. And our money sit in the bank is no point. And we want to save lives. So I go back to see Tansi Mohidin again. And then he said, oh, if Sarawak government wants to do funding first, and then it's federal government payback letter. 
The next street that I go to Sarawak, I will announce. But then change the Prime Minister again. And uh, when Dato Sri Ismail came, I, I told him that we need to. Uh, so, I mean, something in which we will continue to pursue, hopefully, with the state willing to help and the federal to cooperate with us. We may be able to, even though we had an eight uh, oncologists, but I believe that once we have the facilities, there are more and more people can be trained, and then from there we can go to all the other towns. The only way we can do that is uh, we must have a very strong government. Uh, to be able to negotiate with federal government, we must also have a smart people who are in the government who know what they are talking about and how to negotiate. Well, thanks, Prof. I only hope I have half your stamina, <laughs> but you need more rest. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Oh, ha, Sarawak. Over the years, I have had the honor and the opportunity to converse with and learn from my fellow Sarawakians in my routine through Padan sessions. Whether you are students, a farmers, hawkers, professional or entrepreneur, it's always a pleasure to meet with you. Each conversation allows me to understand and learn about the things that truly matter to you. It is through these exchanges we get to gain insights into how we as one people can make Sarawak a better place together. The Sarawak election is just around the corner and I am sure by now you are surrounded by many information and stories. Sadly, some of these stories are made to create hatred, anger and divisions among Sarawakians. Some politicians choose to use these negative tactics because tearing people apart is easy. Actually, contributing and bringing Sarawakians together is harder. Let us all contribute to a positive Sarawak to unite and work for a better tomorrow and by understanding each other. Here, I would like to invite you to join in my digital Turun Padan session as we talk to various hardworking Sarawakians. In each episode, we invite one Sarawakian to have a frank Hard to hard dialogues about things that really matters to them. We will learn their stories, their heartaches, their triumphs, and through it all, let's together gain better perspective about the direction we want to bring Sarawak forwards. Welcome to Hard Talk with Dr. Singh.